life. I was uh, going to get up here and brag on Pastor Seth. Uh, now I'm not 100% sure that I'm going to continue. <laughs> no, I do want to just, I just want to mention something because maybe you're unaware of this, but Pastor Seth is, obviously we know he's an amazing anointed musician and uh, pastor, but just even to watch today as he was back uh, playing the bass and pushing others forward and showing them and, and teaching them and mentoring them, I, that's, that's rare. Um, and so I just, I just want us to be aware of how blessed we are with Pastor Seth and Mona. They have been an incredible blessing to us. And, um, and maybe he fumbles around a little bit with the offering, but other than that. Once a year. Once a year. That's right. <laughs> However, he did just come off of the base and, and leading the team and all those things. So we'll give you a little bit of grace. Just a little bit. Um, well, if you haven't been with us over the last few weekends, we've been in a series that we've called Underdog, and we're super excited about this. I did want to mention something to you. You saw that next weekend is Baptism Weekend, and that is always a great weekend. We enjoy celebrating that together. I do want to tell you we are going to continue in this series also next weekend, so you don't want to miss it. You want to be here. We're going to, we're going to do that. We've got some great testimonies then that we're going to share as well. And so don't just because you can go, oh, well, I'm not getting baptized. I'm going to stay home. No, come, celebrate with your church family, and let's watch what God does. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, I do want to just make mention that between the, the message that we're preaching and the testimony that is shared, there is some content in there that if, if you're concerned, if you've got kids in the room, um, just be mindful of that and uh, nothing really, really hardcore or anything like that, but it is, it, there are topics that maybe will be talked about that will be uh, ones that you'll have to get in the car and explain if you keep your children in the room. Otherwise, we have amazing kids programs throughout this building, and I'd encourage you to bring them to that and uh, let them participate. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 4 says this, For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for all that you're doing. We praise you, Father, because you have done great things. God, you continue to do great things. So, Father, tonight as we look at your word, I pray, Father, that you will show us exactly what we need to see. Father, I pray for those who are watching in, in Malawi and those who are watching in Star Valley, and God, those who are watching in jail and in the prison, and God, we just keep getting more and more word that it's, it's being spread even further and further, and so God, I pray, Lord, that I will get out of the way and that, Lord Jesus, you will be front and center, and Lord, wherever people find themselves in their faith journey, that God, this message, your word will draw them to you, and we just praise you for that, and we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. So if you were with us last week, we, we started talking about Samson, and uh, I'll just give you a little bit of a recap. Samson was a guy who, uh, his mom wanted to get pregnant, she couldn't, an uh, angel shows up, says, hey, you can, you're going to have a baby, but you need to, he needs to take a Nazarite vow, and, and he needs to live his, way, his life that way because God is going to use him to, uh, to help the children of Israel against the Philistines through this, you know, through this man. And so a Nazarite vow, there's multiple things that are involved in that, but the, the key ones that we've talked about are the fact that he couldn't drink or eat of the fruit of the vine. He couldn't touch dead bodies of any kind, whether it was animal or man. He could not cut his hair. And, uh, and so as we looked at this story last week, we began to see that, that Samson apparently lived his life in such a way where it was all about pleasing himself. He wanted himself to be happy. And, and we walked this story out as he uh, found himself walking through a vineyard. He finds himself killing a lion and then touching the carcass later on out of that. That, he finds himself at, uh, at, at odds with some Philistine men. And, and uh, so at the end of last weekend, we spent a little bit of time just looking at uh, Samson had come to a place where, where he was going to get back at the Philistines. And so a uh, really weird story, really odd way of getting revenge, but he, he ties a bunch of foxes' tails together and he puts a torch between them and he sends them out into the field and they burn down all of the, all of the crops and all of the vineyards. And so he takes away all of their, all of their wealth in doing so. And so when we ended last, last weekend, we saw that, um, that then the Philistines go and they burn down his, his once going to be father-in-law's house and, and kills their family. And the Philistines declare war against Israel because of it. 
And now we've come to this place in the story where Israel has said, essentially, listen, yes, he's from us, but we actually don't like him that much, and so we don't want to go to war with you over him. And now we find ourselves in Judges chapter 15, verse 12, it says this, Samson said, swear to me that you won't kill me yourselves. He's talking to the Israelites. Agreed, they answered. We will only tie you up and hand you over to them. We will not kill you. So they bound him with two new ropes and led him up from the rock. As he approached Lehi, the Philistines came toward him shouting, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. The ropes on his arms became like charred flax and the bindings dropped from his hands. Finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey, he grabbed it and struck down a thousand men. Now, I'll stop here for a moment because this is one of those stories that I don't fully under, like a thousand men. We read it, it's a sentence, but he picks up a jawbone and he begins to just brutally beat the Philistines. But think about being one of those Philistines just for a moment because I think there's something we can learn from this. There's a thousand of them. They see one guy, they go out there, he breaks the ropes, he picks up a jawbone, he starts fighting all of these Philistines. Now, if you are Philistine number one through 10, I get it. You think, hey, we got this, we can take this guy. Now, Philistine number 30 through 40, you gotta start thinking, wait a second, something isn't looking so great for us. But imagine being number 999, and a thousand. You're now climbing over the bodies of your friends to get to this guy, and yet somehow, some way they think, oh, I got him, I can take him. I got this guy, I, it's, I, I can do it, right? Like, I, I, I don't know, I just look at scripture different. All right. So he kills a thousand men, it says, and then Samson said, with a donkey's jawbone, I have made donkeys of them, With a donkey's jawbone, I have killed a thousand men. He's very poetic, this Samson. So again, understand something here. We we hear that story, and I remember being a kid, and I'd hear that story, and it was this really cool story of this amazing way, because it says the power of God came on him. So we can celebrate that. But even in the way Samson does it, he breaks his vow. He touched the jawbone of a dead donkey in order to do something that God still used him to do. And one of the things I want you to see in this is is God's continued mercy throughout this story. Because Samson still keeps doing what he wants to do the way he wants to do it, but yet God still shows up. The other thing that's interesting about this in this particular part of the story is that this this is the first time in scripture that we see Samson even acknowledge God. Listen to what he says after that in verse uh, 18. Because he was very thirsty, he cried out to the Lord, you have given your servant this great victory. Must I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? Then God opened up a hollow place in Lehi and the water came out of it. When Samson drank, his strength returned and he revived. So first of all, the first time that Samson even says anything about God that's recorded, he's kind of doing one of those whiny prayers right? Anybody ever do a whiny prayer? We all have done whiny prayers. Let's be real. He now, he has defeated all these guys and he's taken them out and he's done this incredible feat. And now he sits down and at least he says, hey God, you gave me that victory. Followed by, now am I going to, am I going to be thirsty to death? Come on. Where's my, where's a drink? Can you at least hook, hook me up God with something? And he begins to bellyache a little bit. So as I think about this story and even just going back over last week and then this story, all I can think about is the kindness and the goodness of our God. Because I'm going to be honest with you and there are many, 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 many reasons why you should be grateful that I am not God. But in this moment, I would probably have struck this guy with with a lightning bolt. For real, like, uh, okay, seriously, I ju- you just killed a thousand guys. That was because of the power that I gave you, and now you're belly aching because you're a little bit thirsty, right? <laughs> so 
You would think after this amazing victory, God now opens up the ground and there's water for him. He whines, God answers, gives him water. He, his strength returns. You would think that after this, Samson would do something like go to the temple, like he would run to the temple and he would give praise and offering to his God. Or, or if he wasn't gonna do that, maybe he'd run home to his parents and he would say, you won't believe what God did. God used me in such a mighty and powerful way. But you know what Samson does instead? He goes to Gaza and he finds himself a prostitute. How this guy made it into my Sunday school class, I am not quite sure. They definitely did some serious editing in the story when I was in kids' church. So what happens next is the Philistines see him and they devise a plan. He has great strength, but no self-control and little wisdom, and that is a lethal combination. Samson has all of this strength, but his wisdom and his self-control are lacking, and that is his downfall. Many men focus on being strong, but they lack wisdom and self-control, and that not only harms them, but it harms those around them. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 5 says, The wise are mightier than the strong, and those with knowledge grow stronger and stronger. So as the story proceeds, we see that he begins to hang out with this woman, and her name is Delilah. And as we come into this part of the story, this is part of the story that probably most of you, even if you've not been raised in church, you probably are at least somewhat familiar with this story. So I want to look at this for just a few moments tonight. Judges chapter 16, verse 4, it says this. Sometime later, he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorak, whose name was Delilah. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, see if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and how we can overpower him so that we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. And so um, they don't, uh, as, as the story proceeds, they not only want to capture him, but they want to humiliate him because he's humiliated them so many times. And they also see that his character is lacking. And because of that, they see an opportunity. And so Samson, though he, uh, though, he, because, though he had all this great strength, his morals were not so great. And people would first see that, hey, this guy's taken a Nazarite vow, so he must be dedicated and he must be good. But then people would begin to learn that it was a facade. And I want to stop here for just a moment because I think for us as the church in the United States, one of the things that we need to realize is that the world out there thinks that we are a fake, That's true. Yeah. that we are a facade. And I think part of the reason that is, is because many of us have lived our lives with one foot in and one foot out. Yes. We have lived our lives in such a way where we have said, hey, listen, I like this Jesus thing. I like to sing about him on Saturday nights. I like, to, I like to listen to the word. I like to occasionally open my Bible. And I like all of those things. But I also like, and we begin to list the things over here that we like. And so for many of us, what we've done is we've said, listen, I'm okay with this in, in, its, in, in its place. But I also like this. And when we do that, what happens is the world begins to see this isn't real. When we, when we walk that way, when we walk with one foot in and one foot out, then we actually are the underdog. We actually put ourselves into a position of weakness when God has called us to a position of strength. Making a vow is easy. Following through a vow is called character. Making a vow is easy. It's easy to say, like even when we, when we wrap up a, a gathering and, and I, I may end up with, with just saying, hey, I wanna give you an opportunity to, to lift up your hand and to say yes to Jesus, to say, I wanna be a follower. And so in that moment, you're making this vow to God. You're saying, yes, I wanna be who you've called me to be. I wanna live the way that you are asking me to live. And in that moment, it's incredible because the Bible says that that. God separates your sin and your stuff from you, which is amazing. But to make a vow is easy. To follow through with a vow takes character. To follow through says, even when it's hard, I'm going to keep saying yes to Jesus. And when I stumble, because you will, when you stumble, you pick yourself up, you brush yourself off, and you say yes to him again. 
So as we look at this story, Delilah pushes him. She keeps asking, what is your strength? And Samson uh, will, you know, it, he'll make up things. So he says, if anyone ties me up with seven fresh bowstrings uh, that have not been dried, I'll be as weak as any other man. So the Philistines uh, bring her the strings and she ties them up and then they come in and they're gonna, they're gonna take him and he breaks the strings and he beats them up and they humiliates them again and they leave. And then she, and then she, she does it again. She keeps asking until finally in Judges 16, 10, it says, then Delilah said to Samson, you have made a fool of me. You lied to me. Come now, tell me how you can be tied. He said, if anyone ties me securely with new ropes that have never been used, I will become as weak as any other man. So she ties him up and here we go again. They come in, he breaks the ropes, he beats them up, they leave. So she asks again, and basically they go back and forth, if you weave my hair, if you put it in a man bun, whatever, whatever the story is. <laughs> he keeps doing it. He keeps beating them up. They keep coming in, they keep coming in, they keep coming in, and no matter what happens, he beats them up. Judges 15, 15. Then she said to him, how can you say I love you? Here we go. Here we go. How can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? First of all, gentlemen. I'm going to leave that alone. I was about to get brave. My wife's not in the room tonight, but I'll. This is the third time you have made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. With such nagging, she probed him, or she prodded him, sorry, day after day until he was sick to death of it. So he told her everything. Now, what I need you to understand, because when I was a kid, I heard this story, and I always thought, dude, you know what she's going to do. Why would you tell her? She's already proven. She, you said it was tie, tie me up, and, you did, and, they, and then they came in. You know she's working with them. So why? Why would you do it? Why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you keep hiding it? Or why wouldn't you realize, hey, this woman may not have my best interest at heart? <laughs> so he tells her. He, said, he tells her about cutting his hair. And... I just, as I look at this, I can't help but think about the fact that God is so loving because that we may, we may get away with doing what is right in our own eyes for a while, but because he does love us, he knows that there will be consequences, and sometimes he's got to get to a point where he's got to go, okay, this, this, this kid needs some consequences, because yeah. he keeps pushing it and pushing it and pushing it. The only vow that he hadn't broken, he now breaks. His power is not actually in his hair. It is from God. So in this moment, what, he, what he's saying is, I don't think I need God. See, that's the only reason that you tell her. The only reason that you tell her this, if you really think that, oh, if I cut my hair, I won't be strong anymore, then you're not going to tell her because you know what she's going to do with it. But Samson has started to believe his own press. He started to think higher of himself than he actually was. And because of that, now he got, he's gotten to this place where he's like, hey, I'm not supposed to touch a jawbone of a donkey. Look what I did with that thing. Yep. Hey, I'm not, supposed to, I'm not supposed to be in a vineyard. Look, look what I did. Yep. And all these things. And everything has always just worked out for me. So the hair doesn't really matter. It's actually me. I'm the strength. And it's in that moment that things change. Scripture says that she lulls him into a sleep. And God has basically said, this is the last straw. And, the fill, and, they, and she, uh, she shaves his head. God bless him. <laughs> and the Philistines tie him up. When he, woke, when he gets up, he thinks, no problem, I'll break the ropes and I'll do what I've been doing this whole time. But what actually has happened is that now, uh, Scripture says that God left him, but really what's happened is Samson's left God a long time ago. You got you to understand that because God, God didn't leave him. He left God. 
With every one of those steps, Samson just kept getting further and further and further. You know, I'm going to go through the vineyard. I'm going to kill the lion. I'm going to eat the honey out of the lion. I'm going to, I'm going to murder guys. I'm going to do all of these things. Every one of those steps was Samson moving further and further from God. So in this moment, what's happening now is, is God is like, listen, you don't want to have anything to do with me, then that's fine. I'll remove my power from you. And now you get to see what life looks like without me. And some of you have been there. Some of you have walked that out. Some of you have been where you've served God, where you've believed him, where you've taken him at his word. And then you got to a place where you just slowly started to allow yourself to move further and further and further. You've allowed yourself to come to a place where you, where you uh, just maybe have just moments where you, where you compromise here and compromise there, and, and you get further and further, and can I tell you what will happen eventually is God's power will be removed from you, and you will be the underdog again. So the Bible says that the Philistines seized him, and they gouged out his eyes and took him down to Gaza, binding him with bronze shackles. They set him to, gr- to the grinding, grinding grain in the prison, but the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. So can I just say being good at being bad is not good. That's right. Samson was good at being bad and it eventually caught up to him. And you may sit in the room and you may be good at being bad. You may say, hey, you know what? I am able to fool so many people and I'm able to put on a pretty good show. And so I can show up and people don't know all the things that are going on in my life. People don't know about the things I'm looking at when I go home at night. People don't know about the the struggles that I have, but I'm good at it. So I'll be fine. I'll get through. And I'm telling you right now that that may happen for a while, but eventually it will catch up to you. So this is a warning. You have maybe been getting away with some things in your life and you feel as though you are not gonna get caught and it will never hurt you. But can I tell you that if you live selfishly and you don't follow what God has for you, it will catch up to you. God in in his infinite, infinite wisdom and his love says, okay, Samson, you've been pushing for this, so I'm gonna let you go. And he removes his hand from Samson's life. Any good parent knows that you can't, you can't always let your child's uh, actions not have consequences. Yeah. If you allow your child to do whatever they want, whenever they want, and you always are the one there to pick it up for them and make things better for them, eventually they will, not, they will never learn about consequences. And for his whole life, Samson has lived not having consequences. So Samson gets his eyes taken out. And I, wanna, I, I, think that's, I think it's fitting because his eyes were often the thing that got him into trouble. Yeah. Yeah. So often in the stories we see, when the, with the story that we started with last week, it was, I saw a woman, she looks good to me. Yes, that's right. And that was how it started. And Delilah looked good to, to him. And so out, out of this moment, I think that there was, there's this moment where, where God is saying, this is going to be fitting So he then made uh, a slave. He was made a slave at that moment. But the reality is he had been a slave to his own reckless impulses long before he ever became a slave to the Philistines. Judges chapter 16, verse 28. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, sovereign Lord, remember me. Please God, strengthen me just once more. And let me, with one blow, get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. Then Samson reached toward the two center pillars on which the temple stood, bracing himself against them, his right hand on one and his left hand on another. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all of his might, and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus he killed many more when he died than when he lived." So we look at this and I don't know if Samson actually got it at the end or not. I'm not 100% sure because even in that moment, he made it about himself still. Let me get revenge for what they did to my eyes. God, before Samson was born, the angel said, God's gonna use this man. God's gonna use this man to to defend against the Philistines. He's gonna use him mightily. So God accomplished his goal through Samson, but 
He was a tragedy, not a hero. Samson could have been a hero. He absolutely could have been a hero. If he would have lived up to his vows, if he would have stayed on course, if when he made a mistake, he had repented and went back and, 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 and gave God all the glory, he would have been a hero. But instead, he's a tragedy. Why? Because he followed all of his own impulses. The amazing thing is, God's word still came true, even though Samson did it wrong. How, how amazing, if you think about it in that context, you think, oh, well, Samson keeps blowing it. God's just gonna like start over. He'll get somebody else. But God said, listen, if, if Samson wants to live this way, it's, his life will be a tragedy, but it'll still fulfill what I needed fulfilled. God can and will accomplish what he needs to. Our disobedience does not affect God's ability to accomplish his mission or our, his purpose at all. But what it does do is it makes it so that we can miss out. Yeah, it's good. We can miss out on what God actually wants for us. Yeah. Because God's will is never that he's going to, that you go and be disobedient and be this horrible person that lives just all about yourself. And, and even though God may accomplish things through you still, his goal is that you would come to a place where your heart looks like his heart. Where you see people the way he sees people. Where you love people and you love him. And out of that love for him, you respect him. And out of that respect, you live the way that he is calling you to live. And when you do that, then all of a sudden now, you get, you get the benefits of it. But our disobedience can affect the quality of our life. Some of us feel like, oh yeah, I, 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 can, I, can, I can go to church and I can worship and I can love God and all these things and it's gonna be really good, but I can still have all this other stuff over here. And we think like we're getting away with something. But the reality is, is when the one who created you, what, the one who put the DNA in you, says this is who you are, this is what I want for you, this is the way I want you to live your life. When we, when we move from that, we actually rob ourselves of what God sees when he sees us. Samson won victory after victory but his overall story is one of an underdog. God's plan was for victory for Samson, but because Samson wouldn't lean in, because Samson wanted what the world had to offer, every part of this story, as we look at it, he kept going. The, the very people that God said, these are the people you're, you're here to destroy. These are the people you're here to take out. These are the people you're here to protect my children from. Every time he goes and he finds a woman there that he wants to marry, the lot, he finds all, of, he keeps going to the enemy's camp. And some of you need to hear that today because I think that in your heart, you're like, yes, I want what God has for me. I love that. Just keep preaching it and that's great. But yet your actions don't say that because you keep going to the enemy's camp. You're spending more time figuring out how you can get away with stuff than you are figuring out how you can be who God's called you to be. That's the, word. That's the, word. the time is now, and the church needs to understand this. I love that as we were worshiping today, multiple of the songs talked about Goliath falling. Because... If you were here with us on week one, you know that we talked about the, the understanding that even though the world sees David and Goliath as an underdog versus somebody way stronger, when you actually read scripture, you begin to understand that David never saw himself as the underdog. He knew that God was for him. And if God's for him, who can be against him? It doesn't matter if he's nine feet tall, if he's 12 feet tall, if he's 100 feet tall. Because God is able. And this whole series, the hope and the prayer is, is that you're going to hear stories, not only from scripture, but you're going to hear stories from within our church of people who once were an underdog, That's right. but then Jesus. Hallelujah. There's power in that. It's been, it was amazing last week to just see the response as you got to hear Gina's testimony and this week, we have another testimony that we're going to share in just a moment, but I guess I want to preface it with this. I want you to have the understanding that if you sit in the room and you haven't accepted Christ or you haven't been following him, then you are an underdog today. 
But if you've accepted Christ and you said, yeah, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and, and it may mean that, that the war is raging around you and that, that people are coming against you and circumstances are attacking you and all of those things, but you can stand and say, God is for me. That's right. So none of that matters because he is able. Amen. Will you watch this story with me? Hi, my name is Clifford Johnson. Uh, I've been attending the River of Life for nine years now. When I was four years old, I watched my dad pass away. I told God, you leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. And I put that in my heart on that day. And then uh, my mom, a few years later, met my stepdad who wanted to be the father figure to us, to me and my three sisters. So we moved up here to Missoula and everything was good for the first couple of years. And then the abuse started. I'm talking about like breaking of bones, getting knocked out, being thrown through walls. And that abuse continued up until my teenage years. It was in my teenage years that I finally had found a group of people that understood me. They were the outcasts. And from there, with them, I chose to start smoking and drinking. That's what was helping me make it through it. I didn't want to feel anymore. So I started using more, drinking more. And from that, it led to thoughts of suicide. Thoughts became reality. And on multiple different occasions, I tried to kill myself. From my drug use and my alcoholism, I started getting incarcerated because it led to criminal activities. And I was incarcerated multiple times in different states. And it wasn't until 2009 is when I finally got to see a glimpse, just a small glimpse of God in my life, anything good in my life. Because that was the year that my daughter was born. And it was on that day that I made her a promise that she would never see her dad drunk. And it took me until 2013, four years, for me to fully fulfill and make sure that promise would stand. Because it was in 2013, after I'd put her to bed, that I went to her bedroom door, fully intoxicated, because I wanted more. I wanted more alcohol. And I grabbed a hold of the door handle to get her, to put her in the car, to go get more. And I felt something change in me on that day. And instead of opening the door, I went outside and I dropped to my knees and I cried out to the Lord because I had nothing left. I surrendered to him that day because I didn't know what else to do. I saw no other way out. And it was after that, the following week is when I started going to a faith-based recovery meeting and I started uh, attending church because I figured He's my last hope. He's my only hope at this point because I had done treatment. Here at the River of Life, I met my lovely wife here. And I actually, I proposed to her at a, at a ministry here. And that was the begin of a complete change in my life. Things actually re went really well. My wife and I, we bought, you know, we got married. We bought a house, finally bought a house. And then the custody battle for my daughter started, which was drug out. Uh, and from that, we, lo we lost my daughter to her mom because she took her. 
in the middle of the custody battle and we had to file bankruptcy, which ripped out my heart. But even though I lost her and I felt my heart was ripped out, I started singing praise to the Lord, you know, in the middle of my storm, you know, I know that you were with me in the eye of the storm. I know that you were with me. And I felt a sense of joy and a sense of peace. And December 5th of 2021, our house caught on fire and it burned down and we lost everything that we owned. And it was a hard time. But also it was a time of love because I got to see God's love for us and for my family through it all. From the people of this church to the people that don't even go to church, God used. People that didn't even know us, but felt for us and was willing to help out any way that they could. And now looking back on it, every trial, every tribulation that I have ever went through in my life, from the suicide attempts, to the drinking, to the drugs, I can look back at it now and see that God was still with me. He was always there with me. I can see it through people and places and things that he did. Here, they accept you, and I'm thankful for that, that they accept you even when you are broken. But you're never too far God from God. He's always there with you. It's, are you willing to see him? Because he will meet you where you are at just like he met up me. It's amazing because in these testimonies so far, there's been a theme, and the theme is that idea that God is always there, and that he's always calling you back. Yeah. And even just to hear Cliff say that, as things were getting hard, he said, I'm going to praise him in the storm. And for some of you today, as, as the worship team comes up, they're going to lead us in some more worship. But I think it would be fitting for us as we wrap up this time together to just spend the, the last few moments of this gathering saying, God, I'm going to worship you. No matter what's going on in your world, maybe everything's great for you right now. And so then it's really easy to worship. Or maybe you find yourself in the middle of something very difficult and some of the most incredible opportunities that we have to worship God is when we're in a hard season. Because can I tell you, I love, this, I love this idea that if we worship him when it's hard, that's something that we won't even get the opportunity to do when we're in heaven. Do you understand that? Because when we're in heaven, everything's gonna be great. So we'll never have an opportunity like we do while we're here on earth to give God a sacrifice, a true sacrifice of praise to say, I'm gonna praise you, God, even though it's hard, even though I'm in a struggle, even though my finances don't look the way they should, even though my marriage seems to be falling apart, whatever it is, I'm gonna praise you today. I'm gonna to give you glory, I'm gonna offer this to you, and in that moment, all of a sudden what happens is, we say, God, I am not the underdog. I'm praising you because you fight for me. I'm praising you because you love me. I'm praising you because you've got this. And what happens inside of us then is strength begins to well up. Some of you need that strength tonight. So I want to encourage you. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. I want to pray for you. The worship team is going to lead us in worship, but the altars are open. There will be people down here. If you need prayer for something specific, they'd love to pray with you. But let's not, let's not be hasty and leave quick. Let's take a moment. And let's say, God, I, I, I want to praise you tonight. God, we just thank you so much. God, as we look at scripture and then even as we look at stories from within our family, we can see you moving. We can see you at work. We can see your heart. God, you were so gracious with Samson. Even as he kept pushing you away and pushing you away, you stayed and stayed and stayed. God, even as Cliff said that he had made that that deal with you. You leave me alone and I'll leave you alone. God, I'm so grateful 
that you didn't make that deal with him. That God, you pursued him, that you cared for him. Even when he didn't know it, you were there. So Father, I pray for those who feel distant from you right now. For those who feel as though you've abandoned them in some way. God, I pray that tonight they would come to a place of offering a sacrifice of praise. And as they do that, Father, I pray that you will wrap your arms around them, that you will show them not only how real you are, but that you love them and that you see them. God, we give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand as we sing together?
I thank you that we get to gather here and worship you. It's a privilege to be in your presence and to worship you. And God, I pray that we wouldn't take that lightly. We truly have nothing else fit for you, King Jesus, other than a hallelujah, other than a praise you, Lord. God, I pray that you would humble our hearts and that we would that we would run after you. So you would never leave us. You're always right there. So God, I pray that we would turn away, turn away from our, the sin that we may be struggling with give it all to you and we would just say hallelujah Lord I thank you for the chains that broke tonight that broke in this place I know there was revival I know there was healing and Lord there are there are people who are accepting the freedom of knowing Jesus we praise you for that we love you Jesus said